Welcome to this lecture number 4 in our course on fundamentals of transport processes, where we were going through some fundamental background material on vectors and tensors in the last class and we will continue that in the present lecture. To briefly review what we had done in the last lecture, a vector is a quantity which has both magnitude and direction. So, in a three dimensional space, which I will label as x 1, x 2, x 3 in three dimensional space x 1, x 2, x 3, a vector has both magnitude and direction. It is represented by an underbar which means that it is a vector with one direction. So, this vector can be written as a 1, e 1 plus a 2, e 2 plus a 3. And I had written it for you in shorthand notation as summation i is equal to 1 to 3 a i e i, okay, where e 1, e 2, e 3 are the unit vectors in the three directions. The velocity is for example, a vector, it has both magnitude and direction, force is a vector, acceleration is a vector. We had also defined quantities which have two fundamental directions, a second order tensor. An example that I had given you was the stress tensor T, okay, which you can write it in longhand notation as I is equal to 1 to 3, summation J is equal to 1 to 3, T I J E I E J this has two directions associated with it at each point in space. One is the direction of the force, the other is the direction of the unit normal to the surface at which you are measuring the force. Of course, I cannot just write it uh, as an arrow similar to a vector because it has two fundamental directions and we had defined it in longhand for you okay, in the last class. Force per area in i direction at surface with outward unit normal in j direction is d i j. So, at a given location you can measure the force with a surface which is oriented in various ways. The force in the x direction acting at a surface whose unit normal is in the y direction that is the surface itself is in the x z plane is T x y okay, and so on. So, this has two fundamental directions associated with it. You can also have higher order tensors which have 3, 4 etcetera. We would not go through that in this course. The dot product of two vectors was defined as a dot b is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to 3 of a i b i. No unit vectors in this case because I am taking the dot product of two vectors and so you end up with a scalar. I also told you that we can write it as summation i is equal to 1 to 3 summation j is equal to 1 to 3 a i b j e i dot e j. e i dot e j is the dot product of two unit vectors and uh, of course, it is 1 if i is equal to j, it is 0 if i is not equal to j. So, e 1 dot e 1 for example, is 1, e 1 dot e 2 is 0, e 1 dot e 3 is 0 and so on. So, this can be written as summation i is equal to 1 to 3, j equals 1 to 3, <coughs> a i b j delta i j 
where delta i j I defined it for you as the delta function where delta i j equal to 1 if i is equal to j is equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. That is the definition of delta i j. It is called the identity tensor okay. because if you write it out in matrix form it is it is an identity matrix. Okay. So, that was the dot product. Okay. So, the dot product of two vectors a dot b is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to 3, summation j is equal to 1 to 3, a i b j times delta i j. We had also defined the cross product in the last lecture, we had defined it differently. Usually the cross product is written as a cross b is written in matrix form e 1, e 2, e 3, a 1, a 2, a 3, b 1, b 2, b 3. The determinant of this particular matrix, it is a vector, okay. it ends up being a vector. I had showed you a different way of writing the same thing. I had showed you that this can be written as summation i is equal to 1 to 3 e i epsilon i j k a j times b k where epsilon i j k is the anti symmetric tensor is the anti symmetric tensor. Okay. Is equal to one for i j k is equal to one two three three one two Two three one is equal to minus one for i j k is equal to one three two three two one two one three is equal to zero otherwise. called the anti symmetric tensor because if you interchange any two indices it becomes the negative of itself okay. and with this anti symmetric tensor we can construct a cross product okay. and that is this one. Okay. We had also made a notational simplification at the end of the last lecture okay. rather than writing this using a summation and a unit vector we said we can just write it in terms of this alone. The fact that there is an unrepeated index implies that there is already a summation and there is a unit vector. Okay. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in this case I can remove the summations and the unit vectors. T i j has two indices which are not repeated. Therefore, T i j has two summations and two unit vectors. Now, this a i b j it has this dot product has one index that is repeated. Therefore, if I just remove the summation I have one index that is repeated. If it is repeated it represents a dot product and it has become a scalar. So, there is no unit vector associated with this particular index because it has been repeated two times. That means that the unit vectors associated with this have been dotted with each other and have become a scalar. So, there is one summation no unit vectors okay. and similarly for this cross product I could once again remove the summation and the unit vector. So, in this expression there are three indices one of them is not repeated that means there is a summation and a unit vector associated with that two of them are repeated. So, they represent dot products. Okay. So, therefore, the resultant is a vector itself. The other thing that we had discussed in the last lecture was the concept of real and pseudo vectors. Okay. So, a cross product okay, 
between two vectors okay e1 cross e2 for example you know that this is equal to e3 the unit vector in the three direction okay. so if i were using a right handed coordinate system e1 e2 e3 this cross product would be a vector in this direction if i were using a left handed coordinate system if i using a left handed coordinate system in that case this unit vector e3 would be in this direction so the result of a cross product depends upon the right or left handed coordinate system that you are using if it depends upon the coordinate system that you are using it cannot be a real quantity for example if i have some kind of a pipe with a flow going through and i look at the velocity at one particular point that velocity cannot depend upon the coordinate system that you are using to analyze the problem it's a real quantity okay whereas you're finding that the cross product depends upon the coordinate system that you're using so it cannot be a real quantity it is what is called a pseudo vector okay so the cross product of two real quantities in the last class we taken the example of distance and force or displacement and force to give you the torque displacement is real you can actually measure the displacement it doesn't depend upon the coordinate system that you are using similarly force also is real so it depends it's it's, it's an actual quantity you can measure ma velocity you can measure acceleration and you can measure the force the cross product on the other hand the torque does depend upon the coordinate system that you are using so it is not a real vector okay so to briefly summarize uh, the notational simplifications and the few things that we learnt in the last lecture okay we will be representing vectors and tensors mostly in what is called indicial notation that is for each fundamental direction i don't mean the e1 e2 e3 directions but rather directions associated with physical quantities the fundamental directions for velocity is associated with the direction of motion for stress there are two fundamental directions one with the force the other with the direction of the unit normal of the surface at which you are measuring the force so for each of these two fundamental directions you have one unrepeated index okay so if i have the velocity vector i'll just write it as ui it is understood when there is an unrepeated index that there is a summation sign i is equal to 1 to 3 and there's a unit vector okay the stress for example i'll write it as tij there are two unrepeated indices therefore it is understood that there is i is equal to 1 to 3 ei ej one repeated index represents a dot product okay so a dot b you can just write it as ai bi okay. there is one unrepeated index i'm sorry there is one repeated index therefore there is one summation there is no unit vector okay the index repeat is repeated two times okay the cross product was also written okay in terms of dot products okay so a cross b okay it is no it's, it's it's nothing special okay it can be just written as epsilon i j k a j b k that is i have a third order tensor which i'm dotting with two vectors each dot product reduces the order by 1 okay because one repeat repeated index means there is no unit vector for that index there's a second repeated index there's no unit vector for that therefore there is only one unrepeated index and you get a vector okay and the thing to be kept in mind is that whenever you take cross products one has to be careful because you get a pseudo vector okay when you write an equation the order of the vectors or tensors as well as the unrepeated indices 
in all terms in that equation have to be the same. You cannot equate a scalar to a vector for example. Okay. So, with these fundamental rules we can proceed with our discussion of vectors. Okay. The next step is to go look at vector calculus. In vector calculus there are quantities which are defined derivatives and integrals which are defined similar to what they are in scalar calculus. So, let us briefly review the kinds of uh, uh, how you define a derivative in just a scalar function. Okay. If I have some function y as a function of x okay, it is a single valued function okay, that means at each value of x there is only one value of y. Okay as some function and if I want to find out what is the derivative at one particular point okay, I take a small interval. Okay, so, I want to find out what is the derivative at this particular location x. I take a small interval delta x around this point x. Okay. For this small interval delta x I find out what is the difference in y. Okay, when I have moved a travelled a small distance delta x find out the difference in the y coordinate okay. and if I take the ratio okay, delta y by delta x around this point I keep making the interval smaller and smaller and in the limit as the interval goes to 0 as delta x goes to 0 delta y will also go to 0 but the ratio itself will have a finite value. Okay. So, if I take the limit as delta x goes to 0, okay, delta y will also go to 0, but the ratio will have a finite value that is the red derivative dy by dx. So, that is how the derivative is defined. Okay. Now, the equivalent integral relation in, in simple calculus okay, just to revisit that. If I have two in two locations x1, x2, y2 and y1, okay. I know that the integral, the area under the curve, okay, integral dx times the derivative between x1 and x2 is equal to y2 minus y1. Okay, so, that is the integral equivalent of this derivative. In the case of vectors and tensors we would like to derive similar relationships okay, for derivatives and integrals except that you now have vectors which are varying in three spatial coordinates. Okay. The, 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 the relationships themselves will be similar. Okay. So, what this is saying is in the limit of delta going limit of delta x going to 0 of delta x times dy by dx. Okay. That is the derivative times the distance traveled is equal to the change in the function y. Okay. The derivative times the distance traveled is equal to the change in the distance y. So, let us look at our first vector derivative. Okay. Let us say that I have a three dimensional space in which there is a temperature which is varying in some way with, with, with position in this three dimensional space. So, the temperature in a room for example, it is varying it, it, it has different values at different, different locations. Okay. Let us say I am sitting at a point okay, x, x vector okay. and from this point I go a small distance away okay, to a new location x plus delta x okay, where x is equal to x1, x2, x3 it has three components x1, x2 and x3 and x plus delta x also has three components that is x1 plus delta x1, x2 plus delta x2 
x3 plus delta x3. Now, at this particular location, the temperature has some value T and at this new location, it has some other value T plus delta T. Okay. That is the temperature at T at the location x is T and the temperature at the location x plus delta x is T plus delta T. Okay. Similar to what we had in the previous uh, example, the value of the function y has one value at x and it has some other value at x plus delta x in one dimension. So, what is the difference in temperature as you go a small distance delta x? Okay. It is an easy thing to do. Okay. Delta t is equal to partial t by partial x 1 delta x 1 plus partial t by partial x 2 delta x 2 plus partial t by partial x 3 delta x 3. There is a difference in temperature when you have gone a small distance delta x in one particular direction. Okay. Note partial derivatives when I take the derivative with respect to x1, okay, let me just write it down for you here, partial t by partial x1 is equal to limit as delta x1 goes to 0 of t of x1 plus delta x1 x2 x3 minus t of x 1, x 2, x 3, the whole thing divided by delta x 1. Okay. So, when you take the partial derivative, you keep the other two coordinates exactly the same. Okay. So, that is the meaning of the partial derivative. Okay. So, this is delta t. I can write it in vector form in this particular manner e 1 partial t by partial x 1 plus e 2 partial t by partial x 2 plus e 3 times dotted with dotted with delta x 1 e 1 plus delta x 2 e 2 plus delta x 3 e 3. It is a dot product of this displacement vector delta x vector okay, dotted with this quantity here. And this is what is called the gradient of the temperature, gradient of the temperature dotted with delta x. Okay. So, this is delta t. Note that it is very similar to what we had in one dimensional calculus delta x times dy by dx is equal to delta y, delta t is equal to grad t dotted with delta x. Okay. So, this basically tells you if I am looking, if I am sitting at some particular position in space and I move a small distance in some direction, what is going to be the change in temperature when I move that small distance. Note that this grad t itself is a vector which is defined at each and every point in space. Okay. Grad t itself is a vector which is defined at each and every point in space. In this particular case, because I was using this coordinate system, I had defined it in terms of the derivatives in this coordinate system. However, this vector grad t, so, so if, I, if I sit at one particular location and move a small distance to some other location delta x, the delta t that I get should be independent of the coordinate system that I am using to analyze the problem. Therefore, grad t itself the vector should be independent of the coordinate system that I am using to analyze the problem. In some other coordinate system partial t by partial x 1, partial t by partial x 2 and partial t by partial x 3 will change, but the vector grad t will remain the same. It will have magnitude and direction. The magnitude is independent of coordinate system, the direction is independent of coordinate system. Therefore, this is a vector property of this temperature field, the gradient of the temperature field. Okay. So, for our definition of gradient, okay, the gradient is defined as grad t. Okay. Okay. This is a vector.
dotted with delta x is equal to delta t in all directions for any delta x okay provided I take the limit as delta x goes to 0 in the limit as the delta x vector the magnitude of the vector goes to 0 grad t dot delta x is always equal to delta t okay delta t the change in temperature when I go a small distance is equal to the gradient of t a vector which is defined at each point in space dotted with the displacement that I have undergone okay. So, that is the first of our vector derivatives the gradient okay the gradient is, is the first of our vector derivatives it has certain implications okay. So, as I said the grad t is a vector okay. So, it is a vector at each location pointing in some direction it has dimensions of temperature divided by displacement okay temperature divided by distance because grad t times a distance is equal to change in temperature okay. It has some direction okay. And let us say I sit at this particular point okay and I fix the distance that I am going to travel I fix the distance that I am going to travel I fix the distance that I am going to travel but not the direction okay. So, I fix the distance that I am going to travel and I travel in various directions okay equal distance in various directions okay I travel an equal distance in various directions and I measure what is delta t when I travel that distance okay the t at the final position minus the t at the initial position okay what is the difference delta t okay. Now, this difference delta t okay this difference delta t okay for equal magnitudes of the distance travelled okay, delta t for equal magnitudes of the distance travelled is maximum when grad t is parallel to delta x okay. You know that the, the delta t is equal to grad t dotted with delta x okay, let me write this as the gradient here just to, to avoid confusion okay. Grad t is a vector when it is parallel to delta x you get the maximum change in temperature because obviously delta t is going to be equal to the magnitude of grad t magnitude of delta x times cos theta. But the two are parallel theta is equal to 0 and therefore, delta t is a maximum. That means that grad t is in direction of maximum variation of t okay. That means, that grad t is in the direction points out the direction in which the temperature variation is a maximum okay. So, that is the physical significance of grad t as I go in various directions at a point if I go an equal distance in all of these various directions in the direction where the displacement vector and grad t are in the same direction you will get the maximum variation in temperature. Of course, in one direction you will get the maximum positive variation when theta is equal to 0 other direction you will get the maximum negative variation when theta is equal to pi. Okay, so, that cos theta is minus 1, but anyway it gives you the direction in which temperature is varying by a maximum amount. Okay. So, that is the physical significance the first one physical significance of grad t. The second is that if I go along directions which are perpendicular to grad t if I go along a direction which is perpendicular to grad t I will get 0 variation that means that the temperature is a, a variation is 0 in the plane perpendicular to grad t because grad t dotted with delta x is equal to 0. Okay. That means, that the temperature is a constant in the plane perpendicular to grad t okay. written another way grad t is perpendicular is I am sorry is perpendicular to 
surfaces of constant t. Okay, so, grad t is perpendicular to surfaces of constant t. If I travel in the direction perpendicular to grad t, at a given location the direction perpendicular is, is, is a plane, but grad t itself can vary with location and so the, the, the direction the, the, the surface perpendicular to grad t is the surface on which temperature is a constant. So, these are the physical significances of the gradient of a function. It need not be temperature, it can be any function, pressure, uh, concentration, any function. The gradient of that function is along the direction of maximum variation of that function and it is perpendicular to the direction so along which that function is a constant. Okay. Particularly useful for constitutive relations that we had seen in uh, part 1 for the mass and heat transport. If you recall we had written that the flux mass flux J is equal to minus D grad C. The vector direction grad C is the direction along which there is maximum variation of concentration and it is perpendicular to, to, to surfaces of constant concentration. That means that the mass flux is taking place along direction of maximum variation of the concentration field. Similarly, the heat flux Q is equal to minus K grad T. Heat flux is a vector, it is parallel to the gradient of temperature, the vector which is the gradient of temperature. Mm -hmm. So, that is the gradient of a function. Uh, if I write it in longhand notation here, it is just equal to E1 partial T by partial X1 plus E2 partial T by partial X2 plus E3 partial T by partial X3 in this orthogonal coordinate system. But this quantity itself has an identity independent of coordinate systems used. It is a vector which always points in the it is a single valued vector which always points in the direction of maximum variation of that function and it is perpendicular to a surface of constant value of that function. Okay. So, this is the derivative okay, the definition of the derivative. Okay. The definition of the integral is the inverse of this one. Okay. So, if you recall when I made the analogy for the derivative for a single valued function, I said that dy by dx is equal to limit as delta x goes to 0 of delta y by delta x. The inverse of that is the integral, the difference in the value between two end points, uh, uh, difference in the value between two end points is equal to the integral of this derivative. Similar thing can be done for gradients okay. and the integral equivalent of this is as follows. Okay. So, if I have two points A and B okay. and if I go along these two points by some path, okay, if I go by some point path from A to B. Okay. What the integral relation says is that integral along this path of dx dot grad t is equal to the difference in the temperatures between these two endpoints. Okay. That is, if I take so so what does what does this left hand side mean? Let's look at that. Okay. So I'm taking some path. Okay. And along at some location along this path, okay, I, I have this line element. If I just increase this, I have this line element, okay, along this path. Let me write in black. I have this line element, okay. And everywhere along this path, I also have the gradient of the temperature field that is defined, okay. So the gradient of the temperature field here may be in this direction, here may be in this direction, and so on, okay. So, at this particular point I take a unit vector displacement, okay. this is the vector displacement delta x vector. Okay. Along this point I take the unit vector, the, the vector displacement delta x vector dotted with grad t. Okay. So, this is the displacement vector, this is the grad t vector. Okay. So, this is the grad t vector and this is the displacement vector and I take x delta x dotted with grad t. Then I sum that up all the way from the initial to the final location and I get T b minus T a. 
Okay, so that is the integral relationship for grad t. Let us justify how that works. Okay. Okay, why do you get this integral relationship for grad t? Okay, so, so I have this path between the two locations okay. and I can divide that into small little bits. Okay. So, this path I divide into small little bits. Okay. So, this is x a, okay. this is x 1, x 2, etcetera, x n and then x b. I divide into small little bits. Okay. This integral of delta x dotted with delta t, okay, I can write as a summation of grad t dotted with delta x i, okay. i is equal to 1 to n, okay. where delta x i are each of these intervals delta x uh, 1 is between x 1 and x a, x delta x 2 is between x 2 and x 1 and so on. Okay. Okay. So, this is equal to delta x 1 dotted with grad t at the location x 1 plus delta x 2 dotted with grad t at the location x 2 plus etcetera. Dotted with grad t at the location x n. Okay. Now, each of these individual quantities, each of these individual quantities, okay, is related to the difference in temperature between the end points. Okay, by this relationship, grad t dotted with delta x at any point is equal to the difference in temperature between the final and the initial location. Okay, grad t dotted with delta x. If I move to certain displacement the difference in temperature between the final and the initial location. Okay. So, this can be written as T of x 1 minus T of x a that is for the first interval. For the second interval I get T of x 2 minus T of x 1 plus etcetera plus plus T of x n minus T of x n minus 1 plus T of x b minus T of x n. Okay. So, I have just expanded out and you can see that in this first term I have T of x 1, second term I have minus T of x 1. So, these two will cancel out. Okay. Then the second term I will have T of x 2 that will cancel out with T of minus x 2 for the third interval. T of x n will cancel out with T of x n minus 1 for this final interval. And finally, I will just be left with T of x b minus T of x a that is the difference in the temperature at the two end points. Okay, let me just write it clear more clearly for you. That is the difference in temperature between the two end points. Okay. Very similar to the integral expression that I had previously. Okay. Very similar to this one. I am sorry, very similar to this integral expression, except that what we have derived now is in three dimensions for three dimensional displacements. Okay. What we have derived was delta x dotted with grad t between two end points okay. and that has certain consequences. One of the consequences is Okay, so, so the relation that I derived for you was that integral dx dot grad t is equal to this okay, between a and b. One of the consequences is that t of x b minus t of x a depends only upon the end points and that means that this integral dx dot grad t has to be the same if the end points are the same regardless of the path that you take. That means that I have to get the same result whether I go this way 
or I go this way or I go that way or I go by some other path. Okay. So, I have to get the same result regardless of what path that I take for this integral. Okay. So, that is one consequence. The second consequence is that if I start somewhere and go around and come back to the same location. If I start at some point C, go around and come back to the same location, integral between the same endpoints is T at x C minus T at x C. This has to be 0. Okay, that is the second consequence. If you go in a path that ends at the same location that you started, integral dx dot grad T has to be equal to 0. So, that is the second consequence of this. So, the, this is in general more powerful than just the one dimensional uh, gradient vector, okay. I am sorry one dimensional derivative. So, to briefly summarize the gradient of a vector, I am sorry the gradient of a, of a scalar quantity is a vector directed in the direction of maximum variation of that quantity perpendicular to surfaces on which that quantity is a constant, okay, temperature field, concentration field and so on. Okay. And uh, the integral relation for that is that if you go around, if you go from location A to location B along any path and take the integral of dx dotted with grad T along that path, it is always equal to the difference T B minus T A. Okay. So, the difference in temperature is equal to the integral along that path. It is the same on any path that you take and if you start from one location and come back to the same location, integral of dx dot grad t has to be equal to 0. Okay. So, the next quantity that we will do is the divergence. The divergence as you know acts on a scalar, I am sorry acts on a vector, okay, divergence of A okay, and it gives you a scalar. Okay. And how do you define the divergence? Okay. In one dimensional calculus we had defined the derivative by taking a small interval moving a small distance taking the difference in the dependent variable as a function of the distance of the of the interval in the independent variable. The divergence is formally defined okay, as what I need to do is I need to construct a small differential volume delta V okay, with a surface of this volume is S. Okay. So, let me just expand it out a little. Okay, so that is clearer what, what I mean. If I expand it out, I have this differential volume V. Okay. The surface of this volume is S. Okay. At each point along the surface, I have some unit normal vector perpendicular to the surface. This unit normal is defined as the outward unit normal, it is directed outward to the surface. Okay. And this divergence is defined for this vector as integral over the surface of n dot A divided by delta V in the limit as delta v equals to 0. Okay. So, this is a quantity which is defined at each point within the field. Okay. So, for example, if I have a flux vector or a velocity vector, the divergence of that flux vector is defined at each point within the field. Okay. Divergence, construct a small volume at that point, the volume has a surface S on that surface at every point on the surface is defined the unit normal outward unit normal n. You take that outward unit normal multiply it uh, dot it with this vector A. Ok. 
okay, this vector a is once again defined at each point within the field. Okay. You dot it with this vector a, integrate over the surface and divide by the volume. In the limit as your volume becomes smaller and smaller, this quantity will converge to a finite value. The volume itself will go to 0, surface area will also go to 0, but the ratio of these will converge to a finite value and that is what is called the divergence of A. Note that I have taken n dot A. So, therefore, what I end up is with is a scalar, the divergence of A is a scalar. Okay. The other th thing to notice on the numerator I have d s n dot A that means that the numerator has dimensions of surface area times A. The denominator has dimensions of volume therefore, the ratio has dimensions of A divided by length. Okay. Physically this is of course, this divergence. Okay. So, so, if I write this in another way to make the physical interpretation clear. Okay. In the limit as delta V goes to 0, okay, I have delta V times divergence of A is equal to integral d s n dot a. Okay, integral d s n dot a is equal to delta v times the divergence of a. Okay. So, for this particular differential volume, if a were for example, the heat flux, if a were for example, the heat flux, okay. integral d s n dot a, okay. n dot a is the flux outward along the outward unit normal at the surface that is the amount of material coming out of the surface per unit area. That I am integrating over the entire surface. Okay. So, uh, let me just write this to give you a better physical understanding delta V divergence of Q is equal to integral d s n dot Q. Q is the heat flux, heat coming out per unit area per unit time. N dot Q is the total heat coming out of the surface, because the component of Q that is parallel to the surface does not come out. Okay. Only the component that is perpendicular to the surface is leaving the surface. Therefore, N dot Q is the amount of heat coming out of the surface per unit area per unit time. I have integrated this over the surface area. So, integral d s N dot Q is the total amount of heat coming out of the surface per unit area per unit time. Okay. Total amount of heat coming out per unit area per unit time is equal to the divergence of Q times the volume itself. Okay. So, that is a physical interpretation. The divergence of Q okay, is equal to the amount of heat coming out okay, multiplied. So, divergence of Q multiplied by the small differential volume is equal to the total amount of heat that is coming out of the surface. We will see an integral relation of this a little later, which will make the physical interpretation clear. So, how do we relate this to the partial derivatives that we had in the definition of the gradient earlier? Okay. So, in order to find out the formula for the divergence in specific coordinate systems, what we need to do is to construct the differential volume in that coordinate system, calculate the divergence for that differential volume. So, let us do that first for the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. I construct a small differential volume with surfaces along directions of constant coordinate. Okay. So, it has delta x 1 in the x 1 direction, delta x 2 in the x 2 direction, delta x 3 in the x 3 direction. Okay divergence of A is equal to limit as delta V goes to 0 integral d s n dot A divided by delta V. For this particular case delta V is equal to delta x 1 times delta x 2 times delta x 3 and this cubic volume has 6 surfaces. One 
two of which are perpendicular to the x 1 direction, two are perpendicular to the x 2 direction and two are perpendicular to the x 3 direction. Okay. And I have to calculate n dot a over each of these. Okay. So, for the surface that is perpendicular to the x 2 direction, okay, there are two surfaces that are perpendicular to each direction. For the surface that is perpendicular to the x 2 direction, the outward unit normal is in the plus x 2 direction. So, the outward normal is E 2. Okay. So, if I calculate this integral d s n dot a okay, for this surface in the plus x 2 direction. Okay. So, I am constructing my volume around the center point here. Okay. Let us call this center point as x 1, x 2, x 3. Okay. So, because the center point is at x 1, x 2 and x 3, the surface on the right okay, is at x 1 x 2 plus delta x 2 by 2 and x 3. Okay. So, this surface here is at x 1 x 2 plus delta x 2 by 2 and x 3. Okay. So, therefore, on the right hand side I have E 2 dotted with A vector at x 1 x 2 plus delta x 2 by 2 x 3 that is for the surface on the right. times the area itself. The area of the surface is delta x 1 delta x 3. Okay, the area of the surface is delta x 1 delta x 3 because it is perpendicular to the x 2 direction. Okay. For the surface on the left, the unit normal is in the minus E 2 direction because the unit normal for that surface, the outward unit normal is pointing in the minus E 2 direction. Okay, for the surface on the left, the outward unit normal is pointing in the minus E 2 direction. So, I will have minus E 2 dotted with A at x 1 x 2 minus delta x 2 by 2 x 3 times delta x 1 delta x 3. So, out of the six surfaces that this volume has, this is for the first two surfaces perpendicular to the x 2 coordinate. Okay. They have unit normals in the uh, plus E 2 and minus E 2 direction. Okay. And then you have two surfaces which are perpendicular to the x 1 direction that is the front and the back. Okay. Along the front surface, the front surface is located at x 1 plus delta x 1 by 2 x 2 x 3 the back surface is at x 1 minus delta x 1 by 2 x 2 and x 3. Okay. For the front surface, the unit normal is along the E 1 direction dotted with A at x 1 plus delta x 1 by 2 x 2 x 3 times the area perpendicular to the x 1 direction. So, the area is delta x 2 delta x 3. And then I have the back surface okay, at which the unit normal is in the minus E 1 direction at the surface at the back. So, I will get plus minus E 1 dotted with A at x 1 minus delta x 1 by 2 x 2 x 3. And then I have the top and bottom surfaces, they are perpendicular to the x 3 plane. Okay. So, the unit normal at the top surface is plus E 3, surface is located at x 1, x 2, x 3 plus delta x 3 by 2. Similarly, the bottom surface, the unit normal is in minus E 3 direction, surface is located as x, x 1, x 2 and x 3 minus delta x 3 by 2. It is a straightforward extension of what I just uh, derived for you.
okay so that is only this part alone okay now i have to divide by delta v okay i can simplify this as you can see this e2 dot a is just a2 the component in the x2 direction of the vector a similarly minus e2 dot a is minus a2 okay so i can simplify that okay so this becomes is equal to delta x 1 delta x 3 into a2 at x 1 x 2 plus delta x 2 by 2 x 3 plus delta x 2 delta x 3 to a 1 at x 1 plus delta x 1 by 2 plus delta x 1 delta x 2 a 3 now i have to divide by volume volume is delta x1 delta x2 delta x3 so i divide the whole thing by delta x1 delta x2 delta x3 so i get integral ds n dot a divided by delta v is equal to when i divide throughout by delta x1 delta x2 delta x3 the delta x1 and delta x3 over here will cancel out i'll get this whole thing by delta x2 plus so when i take the limit delta x1 delta x2 delta x3 going to 0 this just becomes partial a2 by partial x2 plus partial a1 by partial x1 plus partial a3 by partial x3 okay. so that is the divergence in a cartesian coordinate system now i have to derive for you the integral relation for this the divergence okay that we will continue in the next lecture in the meantime please go through what we have done in this class before coming for the next class i will briefly revise what has been done here so that there is some continuity and then we will proceed from here to define divergence its integral relation curl and its integral relation as well okay we will derive these formulas in a cartesian coordinate system for the present but as we proceed i will also show you how to derive it in other coordinate systems we had done it previously when we did mass and energy conservation equations we did these things we did balances and we got out certain quantities and said this those were the divergences gradients and so on this is a more systematic way of doing it and we will go through this in detail before we proceed to to the fluid mechanics so we will see you in the next lecture mm -hmm.